Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Um, I think that goes for everybody in the in the audience, but also all of our all of our panelists. I think it's afternoon, morning, or evening uh, for at least one of us. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this CPA webinar, leading the way: how the Commonwealth can empower persons with disabilities. Uh, I should note that this is the fourth in a series of webinars that we've been delivering um, in in February and March. Uh, we've already heard uh, presentations and had sessions on diverse topics such as climate change, international humanitarian law and social media. And we're greatly looking forward to having our fifth and final online webinar on youth activism uh, that's taking place on Monday, the 8th of March uh, at the radically different time of 5 a.m. Uh, UTC. Uh, so that's 5 a.m. London time. Uh, I'll quickly go through some housekeeping. I don't wanna to spend too long on it. Nobody's here. Um, to listen to housekeeping and, and formalities. Um, I should also advise that the, the original chair for this session, uh, the Honorable Kevin Murphy, Speaker of the Nova Scotia House of Assembly, uh, and also the chairperson of the Commonwealth Parliamentarians with Disabilities Network uh, is unfortunately not able to join us. Uh, he's, he's very, very busy preparing the first ever hybrid session uh, for the House of Assembly, which is no small feat. Uh, so we more than understand his, his inability to, to join us, but he sends his warmest regards uh, and also his sincerest apologies. Uh, so thank you very much to, uh, to Speaker Murphy and um, many thanks to Speaker Murphy for everything he's, he's, he's done for our network and, and persons with disabilities. Um, so just a few very, very, very quick uh, housekeeping matters. Uh, I should advise that this webinar is being recorded uh, but it's not being live streamed. So if anybody uh, wishes to make a request for certain parts of this recording to be uh, removed from the final recording or, or, or any edits or, or any concerns, uh, please do message us. Uh, we're more than happy to take, take feedback on board and, and, and do the necessary. Um, as this session is a Zoom webinar, uh, attendees don't have the ability to unmute or turn their cameras on. Uh, however, at the end of the presentations from our panelists, uh, we will then enter a Q&A session. Um, so we absolutely encourage you to use the chat function uh, or indeed the Q&A function that should be present on your screen. Uh, and should you wish, um, you can request that your question remain anonymous uh, when it is being put to the panel. We won't, we won't reference you if, if, if you prefer not to be. Uh, also talking of the chat function, please do feel free to chat with your fellow attendees using the chat function. Uh, it's why it's there, it's why we hold, uh, it's a big reason why we hold these webinars is, is the peer-to-peer -peer learning aspect and the chance to share ideas and, and, and best practices. Um, and also please do use the chat function if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, um, audio difficulties, visual difficulties, and anything that we can assist with, uh, and we'll aim to help in, in any way that, that we can. My colleague Clive Barker's on this call, um, and, and he'll be doing a fantastic job, I'm sure, taking care of all the technical side of things. Uh, and finally, and I'm sure this won't be an issue in this forum, uh, the CPA is committed to and recognises the value of maintaining environments of mutual respect, courtesy and dignity, uh, at all its events and programs, and, and that also goes for our online programs. Uh, so we would kindly ask um, that everybody, uh, either in the chat or, 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 or during other discussions, please do adhere uh, to, these, to these principles. Um, as I said, I didn't want to spend too much uh, time on the, on the housekeeping. Uh, we are here for the, the, the substantive uh, part of the presentation. Um, so I will, I will try and go straight into it. Uh, and introduce our first speaker. But the Honourable Mike Lake is the Member of Parliament for Edmonton with Taskawin and was first elected in 2006. After his re-election in October 2008, Mike was appointed Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Industry, uh, a position to which he was reappointed after the 2011 election. On the 13th of September 2012, Mike was sworn into the Queen's Privy Council after being asked by the then Prime Minister Stephen Harper to serve on the Priorities and Planning Cabinet Subcommittee on Government Administration. On the 21st of October, 2019, he was re-elected to a fifth term, receiving the highest vote total out of all candidates from all parties across the country. And Honorable Mike Lake is also a, a, an advocate uh, for persons with disabilities, having spoken at the Global Disability Summit that took place in London in 2018. Uh, so Honorable Lake, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the microphone, I'll give you the floor. Awesome, thanks, James, and uh, it's uh, it's fantastic to be here. I, I'm looking at the participants list, and I see a, a good friend of mine, Robert Kitchen, uh, here as well from Canada. I'm going to share my screen almost immediately and uh, jump in because uh, my my presentation is nothing without sharing a little bit about uh, my motivation for it. So, um, going to jump over. Hopefully, let me just see. I don't think it didn't spotlight that. So let me try this again. So. Sorry about that. Uh, let's go there. That should work. 
Okay, are you able to see my my uh, um, PowerPoint right now? Uh, yes, we are. Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, so um, the, the, what I'm gonna share about is, and, and it's just an honor to be here. I have a son uh, with autism. Jaden is 25 years old now. It's hard to believe how fast time flies. He was nine when I was first elected. Um, and we've had the, the honor to sort of go on this journey together. Jaden, um, you know, he's, he's a, a unique kid, as you're going to see in, uh, in a couple of these videos that I'm going to show you. And I'm going to start off with the very first video. This one's just a simple kind of a, a moment uh, a few years back that my daughter captured on her, on her cell her iPhone here in the basement and uh, actually just behind me in there on the couch. And uh, there's a song that uh, I've sung to Jaden for, for years since he was a little kid when he, uh, you know, when he goes to bed at night and, uh, and then when I'm leaving to travel or whatever the case is. And uh, just in the last few years, he started to uh, sing it. And we just to tell you, show you a little bit about the impact that he has. We shared this on our, on my Facebook page and within a week, he got 1.4 million views because Jaden just has this incredible connection he's nonverbal, but just the way he connects with people is amazing so i'm gonna start by showing that video okay ready look at my eyes Good job. That was nice. Well, so one of the, as you look at the video that's on the screen still, uh, one of the first comments we got on the Facebook page was from somebody on the autism spectrum themselves who said, wow, you have a lot of remotes. So you can see on the uh, side there, uh, I don't know, eight or 10 remotes over there. Um, but I'm going to dive right in. I, I don't normally in a 15 minute presentation, I, I have longer presentations that I do, but I don't often show this next video in the 15 minute one. But, um, but I w chose this one because we're dealing with parliamentarians and most of us have to do media at some point in time. And in 2010, we decided to do a live interview, uh, me and Jaden. Jaden was 15 at the time. And uh, it was in the foyer of the House of Commons, which is a very echoey place. And, uh, and we're live and, uh, and, and with Jaden, it can be a little bit unpredictable. I told the host, no matter what happens, we're just gonna run with it. And the host asked me about five seconds before we went live, he said, uh, well, Mike, thanks for changing your travel plans to be here today. So he didn't ask me anything, he just met, said that. And, uh, and Jaden is obsessed with travel and he's obsessed with plans, with calendars, with schedules. So Jaden had to know what the answer was just as we were going live. So this is what it looked like. Welcome back to Power Play. I'm Tom Clark. Well, there are a number of stories around this place that very rarely get into the papers. We're going to introduce you now to just one of them. Mike Lake, member of parliament, conservative member of parliament, and his son, Jaden. Now, Mike has been a champion of the cause to find a cure for autism. As you can tell, Jaden uh, suffers from autism. I'll explain actually here quickly. Please go a, ahead. Yeah. A little explanation. I just mentioned that we had switched from uh, taking a, uh, a train, which we were going to take, yes. to a, a plane when we decided to come on the show. And uh, he is very um, uh, tied to his schedule and likes to know exactly what's going on. So I made the mistake of mentioning that to you as we were starting the interview, and uh, and Jaden caught on and wants to hear a little bit more about it. So. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, tell me something, uh, Mike, about. Uh, what it's like bringing up Jaden in your family and, and, and what that's meant to you. you know, it's a, I'll just explain. We're, we're going to take at 7 o'clock, we're going to take a plane ride, okay? At 7 o'clock. What it's been, what it's like is, uh, it's, it's interesting. He's, he's an amazing kid. We go through moments like this sometimes. Yep. And uh, uh, it's unscripted. This is why one of the things that I always suggest to parents when they're talking about their kids with autism and trying to get across what autism is, is to take their take their child and meet their elected officials, their their member of parliament, their MLAs. Um, don't be afraid, I always say to them, and this is a real life example, don't be afraid of taking your child in to meet them. And they say oftentimes, well, what if my child acts up? How am I supposed to ex properly explain? And I say, if, you're, if your child acts up and acts like he, has, he or she has autism, you've explained it better than you could possibly explain it with words. Right. Don't right? hide them. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Don't hide them. 
So the one thing as you watch that and you, you see that we've all had experiences where we're serving our constituents and seeing uh, someone come in with a family member who has a disability of some sort and, and some challenge. I think the important thing to remember is um, as you see the sort of back and forth and the challenge I'm having uh, communicating there, the important thing to remember is that for you in that meeting, that's half an hour or a much shorter interaction if it's at an event or something like that, but for the um, you know, for that family or for the individual with uh, with whatever the disability might be, that is 24-7, the, the life that they lead and some of the challenges that they face is, is, is longer than that. And so just something to kind of take with you. Also, with autism, the language has changed. The, the interviewer used the word cure and used the word suffers with aut or phrase suffers with autism. We wouldn't use language like that when we're talking about autism anymore. Um, it's uh, you know it's something that certainly has challenges and and uh, and strengths that come with it, and we want to mitigate the challenges so that we can unlock the potential of people with autism. And the next video I'm going to go to fast forwards a little bit uh, and shows Jaden in an environment where he is able was able to use his strengths and, and continues in this type of environment to use uh, strengths that may be surprising to people. And so we had an opportunity. Um, when he was in his, his last years of high school to have uh, um, CTV, our, our national, one of our national TV stations come out and do a, a, a broad, uh, an interview or story uh, about Jaden working in the school library. And so uh, this is, this is Jaden um, working at something that he absolutely loves and is really good at. Now that stigma often follows children into adulthood, holding them back from their full potential. But the tide may be turning. Tonight we have the story of one young man who shows what can be achieved if given a chance. Here's CTV's Alberta Bureau Chief, Janet Dirks. When it comes to putting away library books, Jaden Lake leaves others in the dust. Jaden, can you do these ones too? He's not just fast, he's accurate. He's better than us at most of these tasks. He just knows exactly where everything goes and how to do it. Jaden has autism. He was diagnosed when he was two. Now 19, he volunteers at this school library in Edmonton. While he's nonverbal, he's an enthusiastic worker. Do you like lurking in the library, Jaden? Jaden also catalogs and labels and works with computers. He could work um, in an office or a bank or you know, anywhere where there is numbers and organization. He's excited to work. He's excited to uh, keep working. Jaden's father is Edmonton MP Mike Lake. He wants employers to give adults with autism a chance. He wouldn't be able to do a job interview. Uh, that would be a challenge for him. So uh, if he wanted to work in a library or a warehouse or somewhere where he would be able to use these skills, he would need somebody to help him. He would need somebody to communicate for him and explain what it is that he's good at. Research shows adults with autism spectrum disorder are underemployed. An Ontario study revealed only 13% work full-time. Just 6% have part-time jobs. In Calgary, Garth Johnson wants to change that. His company connects businesses with adults with autism in software and website testing. Dedication, commitment, um, focus, um, they will do this job again and again and again for a long time, a lot longer than we would do jobs and still love it. Advocates for people with autism say it's not about charity, it's about creating opportunities and workplaces stand to benefit most of all. Janet Dirks, CTV News, Calgary. So you see in that video, you see a real, um, just this passion that he has. And uh, and you can tell that he's had a very supportive environment throughout his schooling years. And you know, one of the things that's a real passion for me, I, I, I love working in the world of international development generally, and love working in the sort of autism advocacy, um, disability advocacy uh, world as well. And uh, you know, it's, it's disheartening to me and, and a real you know challenge for us as a global community that uh, tens of millions of kids like Jaden are not in school and don't have even the opportunity to um, to be seen for their strengths or have you know people help with their challenges in that school environment um, you know in many many places in the world so uh, this is where my uh, my heart is this is where a big part of my work is is working in the international development uh, community working with a in my role as the as on the executive of the international parliamentary education network which if you're interested in uh, talking about that people can reach out to me on that 
I am going to show one last video, so I'll jump to that quickly, and then I know we'll have some time for Q&A at the end, and people can reach out to me. This next one's kind of a, a funny one, because it's my, it's my favorite video of all the videos we use in the presentation. It's four minutes long, just to give you an idea. Um, the, uh, the reason it's a little bit weird right now is because it's at an event called We Day in Canada from several years ago, and there's a whole a whole thing with uh, the organization and the government of the day in Canada, but uh, it doesn't take away from the fact that uh, in 2016, Jaden and I had the chance to speak to 15,000 kids, um, and uh, and it was uh, it was just a great opportunity. And if you watch Jaden, he's just in his zone, not nervous at all, just checking things out all the time, uh, walking around the stage with me. My favorite part of the entire four minutes is the last 50 or 45 seconds, where we have a clip of uh, interview we did way back eight years ago um, with my 13, then then 13 year old daughter who's 21. And I love the fact that of all of the interviews I've ever been a part of, the smartest answer, the best answer has been given by my then 13 year old daughter in this piece. So there you go. Now, you know sharing with others is much more than about sharing your own talents. It's about taking the time to discover the talents and the gifts that your peers have as well. So here to tell us more are Edmonton MP Mike Lake and his son Jaden. Give it up. Hey, we day. What a fantastic day. So I'm going to introduce you to Jaden right now, and I'm going to let him say hello. And then after he does that, you have to applaud for him. Okay, so say hi to him. <laughs> Jaden has autism, and sharing his story around the world is one of the most meaningful things we get to do. Jaden's unique impact can be linked to hundreds of young people like you who've invested in him over 20 years. Jaden's nonverbal, has trouble with abstract concepts. He'll cry when he's sad, or squeal loudly or giggle when he's happy. When something's on his mind, he'll grab my face and inquire with an escalating ba 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 until he gets the explanation he needs to move on with his life. He's obsessed, absolutely obsessed with dogs. <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> to the point where he'll go nose to nose with any dog, regardless of size, something we always have to be aware of. In my annual World Autism Day statement, I mentioned four years ago that Jaden was very much like other 16-year-olds. He loves baking chocolate chip cookies, working in the school library, and bowling with dad on Saturday mornings. Jaden's sister, Janae, was quick to remind me at the time, Daddy, no other teenage boy loves doing those things. But Jaden the adult is very much like the Jaden we've known from childhood, almost inconceivably innocent. For those who don't know him, Jaden's really easy to underestimate. Yet for those who do get to, to know him, Jaden's upside is immeasurable. He's the friend who always believes the best about you, the worker who never wants his shift to end, and the student who makes all of the others better. He's the brother who loves his sister and isn't afraid to show it, and the son who every single day reminds his parents that there's incredible joy to be discovered in even life's most difficult circumstances. Make no mistake, autism and other developmental disabilities come with very real challenges. But as we work together to understand and address those challenges, our country will unearth a, tr a treasure of unique talents and abilities. We just need to take the time to look for them. Now, now here's a clip of Jaden with Janae, who at just 13 years old captured perfectly how we all feel about Jaden. I'm going to ask you a really hard question here, okay? I know you can handle it, which is why I'm giving you the heads up on it ahead of time. Do you ever sometimes wish that your brother was quote unquote normal, like every other kid? Honestly, since Jaden was diagnosed with autism before I was born, I don't exactly know what a normal brother is like. So Jaden kind of is my normal, like having autism and stuff. So I don't really wish that he was normal or anything. You like him the way he is? Mm -hmm. If he was like, if he didn't have autism anymore, or it was like cured or something, he wouldn't be the same as like Jaden was now. So I'll leave, you, I'll leave you with this thought. The more that a normal life for Canadians includes people like Jaden, 
the more we can work together through the hard stuff and allow every single one of our brothers, sisters, neighbors, and friends to thrive. Uh, thank you so much for including us in your day to day. And as I always do, I'm going to let Jaden have the last word. So say bye bye to everybody. There. there you go. Thank you. So that is, uh, that's Jaden there. And I, uh, I'm going to stop the share now so I can come back here. But uh, I, uh, it's, it's my favorite thing. Jaden had this incredible supportive environment. And one of the things that I always point out when, they, when people watch that clip is that Jaden, Janae's, Janae didn't have a choice. Her normal included Jaden because Jaden's three and a half years older than her and he was there before she was. So she was born into a family with Jaden, but the school they went to, you saw the clip of the school, they did have a choice and they chose to include Jaden. And because of that, for all of the students that went to that school, Jaden was a part of their normal. And it's interesting because we put Jaden in that school because we want, we're thinking about him and how the impact it would have on him, which was amazing. But when Jaden graduated, every single one of the students that went to school with him would say that their life was uh, was immeasurably better because Jaden was in it. And so I will close with that. I'd love to take questions later on uh, or from people that might want to reach out later. But I really I'm so appreciative for you, including uh, including me and Jaden, I guess, uh, virtually in your day today. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Lake. Uh, and, it, and it's great to see. Um, that in all your in all your sort of advocacy work, you have Jaden stood stood there right right alongside you, um, so that's that's fantastic to see. Um, and yeah, absolutely, this idea of of what is normal or or, or how do we define normal, uh, and and where do we look for sort of normalization is is something that we always need to need to be thinking about. Um, and I'll and I'll also just pick up on one other thing that you you spoke about, um, and it was after the uh, interview you had. I think it was in in that in the House of Commons. Um, where they talked about cures and suffering from, um, and I'd and I'd flag that uh, absolutely language is is very very important in this space. Uh, and the Commonwealth Parliamentarians with Disabilities Network uh, has produced uh, two guidelines on on sort of appropriate language uh, and inclusive language um, that can be used sort of within the parliamentary setting, but also sort of applicable in many other um, spaces and and, and fora. Um, so yeah, we're very aware of um, the importance of, of, of language and, and be more sensitive um, and, and intelligent in, in the language that we use. So, so thank you so much for that presentation, incredibly uh, touching. Uh, I can absolutely see why 1.4 million people viewed, uh, viewed that first video. Um, I'll now uh, come back to Senator Radzi, who I understand can now hear us perfectly fine. Senator Radzi, apologies, my my doorbell is is ringing. That's uh, one of the uh, one of the effects of home working, uh, and unfortunately yes. during the lockdown. Um, Senator Radzi, I gave a brief introduction to you. Um, you probably didn't didn't hear me give it, so um, uh, you didn't hear me mispronouncing a lot of uh, Malay words, I'm sure. Uh, but if I could just give a very a very very brief uh, very very brief introduction uh, uh, to you, um, and and apologies to everyone who who heard this once before, but uh, just to just to reiterate. Uh, what is a glittering uh, CV. Um, as one of the leading voices for persons with disabilities, or OKU, in Malaysia, Senator Radzi has relentlessly fought for the rights of her fellow OKU. She holds a post of advisor for Persatuan Puera K9, a support group for spinal cord injured patients, and has also set up a non-governmental organization of her own called Persatuan OKU Central. Uh, as co-founder and president of OKU Central, her aim is to empower the disabled community by helping them in pursuing their education, career, and other activities. Uh, Senator Razi has worked tirelessly with a strong task force to empower and create awareness for persons with disabilities. And for these outstanding contributions, the Honorable Senator uh, was uh, bestowed with a prestigious award of Toko Shri Kandi Nagara in 2014 and, and very well deserved too. Uh, and on the 5th of May, 2020, she was called to represent persons with disabilities uh, in the upper house of the Parliament of Malaysia. Uh, Senator Razi, you, you have the floor. Thank you so much, James. Um, I'd like to say uh, hello to Honorable Mike Lake. Um, I also have a son who's uh, um, autistic, so that was really wonderful to see your videos. Um, and hello, everybody. Um, I actually have um, a pretty lengthy speech. I'm going to try and compress it. Um, just so you know, in Kuala Lumpur now, it is uh, 
22.32. So I've uh, been up since very early in the morning, but I'm so excited to, to share with you guys some of the stuff that we're doing right here in Malaysia. Now, um, I've just done a little uh, write-up um, with the title of uh, Leading the Way, um, How the Commonwealth Can Empower Persons with Disabilities. Um, um, I'd like to thank everyone again, um, CPA, for inviting me to this uh, webinar session. Yeah, And uh, today I'll be uh, sharing disability-sensitive legislation in Malaysia and also some efforts taken by myself as a uh, senator uh, for the PWDs for our disabled community. By the way, James, your Malay was it's not bad. <laughs> now, uh, in Malaysia, the Article 8, Bracket 1 and Bracket 2 of the Federal Constitution 1957 has provided uh, equality of all before the law and protection for all citizens against discrimination on grounds of uh, race, descent or place of birth in any law. Despite um, this constitutional guarantee, persons with disabilities still face uh, problems um, in developing ourselves as we're deprived of many basic rights like education, employment, accessibility, and other economic and social opportunities. In tackling this situation, um, the government of Malaysia has made serious series of efforts to uh, recognize and protect the rights of PWDs by ratifying uh, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, CRPD, adopted by the UN's General Assembly. The Malaysian government has also sanctioned the PWD, uh, PWD Act 2008, which reflects uh, its recognition to the existing and potential contributions made by PWD to the overall well-being and diversity of the community and society. Now, in 2010, Malaysia was among the first country to ratify the CRPD with uh, disabilities adopted by the UN. Uh, the Malaysian government have also made a step forward uh, by enacting uh, the PWD Act 2008, the statute seeks to uh, provide for uh, social protection services in areas such as health, rehabilitation, and education for children uh, with disabilities guided by the National Policy for Persons with Disabilities and the National Plan of Action for Persons with Disabilities. Now, in general, uh, in general uh, the PWD Act 2008 promote development and also enhancement of the quality of life and well-being uh, for PWDs. There is a promotion of better accessibility to common facilities, including services, building, public transport, and public amenities. This statute also encourages and supports any uh, appropriate measures to recognize the skills at the workplace, the employment opportunities, uh, foster the level of education for children with disabilities, collect data and research, training professionals in, in rehab services, and many other functions. Um, directed by the Minister for, Proma, for proper implementation of the Act. Now, um, having said that, despite all measures, to, uh, all measures to improve the quality of PWDs uh, in this Act, there are a significant omission in the PWD Act, which constitutes a gap to the existing Act, which includes uh, the non-remedial nature of the Act, um, which makes it non-enforceable in certain conditions. Section 41 of the statute requires any plaintiff to legal suit arising from the neglect of rights um, in the Persons with Disability Act 2008 to observe an additional ingredient of good faith. And there is a, a shield uh, protecting any uh, civil servants and the government by virtue of Section 42 of the PWD Act 2008. The lack of any or any comprehensive monitoring mechanism against parties who violate the PWD Act or the rights of persons with disabilities. That means if anyone, for example, parks at our parking space, um, we cannot come, uh, meaning we, we can't do anything about it right now. Uh, so what I am doing with um, a team of my friends, um, uh, we're working very closely uh, with our ministry, um, at the welfare department, and um, you know to to strengthen uh, our PWD Act 2008. Now, then there's the lack of specific anti-discrimination and anti-harassment provisions. Uh, the PWD Act 2008 seeks to enhance the lives of persons with disabilities by promoting civil rights and equality. Thus, it is only appropriate that it is non-discriminatory in nature. In order for it to function as a tool for enhancement, it is essential that the statute should have remedial measures. This is due to the fact that one of the most important measures, including the existence of remedial provisions to address any issues of breach might possibly occur in the future. However, despite the passing of the laws and standards due to the limited power of the National Council for Persons with Disabilities and absence 
of punitive provisions in the PWD Act 2008, as how I mentioned earlier. Many buildings, for example, are still inaccessible to PWDs since there is no penalty clause in case anyone fails to abide by the provisions. Now, this is a clear proof <clears throat> of non-enforceability of our PWD Act 2008. Furthermore, uh, the non-existence of any punitive provision in the statute has made it uh, not a legal obligation to abide by the PWD Act 2008, but merely a choice. This shows that there is no punitive provision in the statute, making it a, a non-remedial uh, provision and thus making it non-enforceable. As far as our PWD Act 2008 is concerned, the purpose of the law is to promote the enhancement of life of PWDs. However, it was found that the Act is without any specific remedy uh, for persons with disability in situations where our rights um, is breached. So, hence, we need to amend the Article 8, Bracket 2 of our Constitution to prohibit discrimination against disability. We need to amend the PWD Act 2008 to fulfill uh, Malaysia's responsibilities and the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, CRPD. And also, um, we uh, need to amend it to include enforcement mechanism. We also um, need to amend Article 8, Bracket 2 of our Constitution to prohibit discrimination on the grounds of uh, disability. Article 8, Bracket 2, if you get a chance to read it someday, guys. Our constitution prohibits discrimination on the basis of religion, race, ethnicity, place of birth, or gender. However, disability is not one of the reasons. The absence of such uh, a ban does not reflect our desire to be a developed country with an inclusive society. There are five countries in uh, East and South uh, East uh, Asia region that explicitly guarantee equality or non-discrimination for the disabled. The five countries are Fiji, Nepal, New Zealand, Thailand, and Timor-Leste. Although Nepal is a low-income country, it still prohibits disability discrimination in its constitution. By amending our Article 8, Bracket 2 to prohibit disability discrimination in Malaysia, we'll send a strong message that we must stop segregating and separating people with disabilities and start incorporating and integrating them into society. Now, we need to amend our PWD Act so that the Act shifts from being an administrative law to a law that promotes, protects, and ensures full and equal employment and uh, I beg your pardon, an equal enjoyment of all human rights and fundamental freedoms with all uh, PWDs. We can achieve this by amending the Act to be in line with the CRPD, uh, God willing, and incorporating enforcement mechanisms. Malaysia is a party state to the CRPD. In addition to being legally bound to perform our, obli our obligations to it, we must withdraw our reservations for Articles 15 and 18 and sign the CRPD optional protocol. Basically, the enforcement mechanism means to amend our act to have provisions on the following areas. Define discrimination and harassment in various aspects. Now, Describe available medications in the event of discrimination and harassment. Issue sections 41 and 42 of the PWD Act. Sections uh, 41 and 42 prevent governments and civil servants from being sued for failing to fulfill their duties and obligations under the Act. We need to establish an, an independent commission entrusted to Parliament to monitor the implementation of the Act. The Commission of Persons with Disabilities should be provided with the necessary powers and resources, either manpower or funds, uh, to investigate complaints or violations of UN law. When there is um, uh, a complaint, the Commission must first act as a mediator between the parties. If mediation fails, the Commission must uh, take the case to court, which should also be enshrined to UN law. We need to establish a tribunal to deal with cases involving violations of our Act. This Tribunal for Persons with Disabilities is a special court uh, consisting of disability experts. This tribunal provides access to justice, which is much cheaper and faster and less troublesome and stressful than ordinary courts. It is timely for Persons with Disability Act 2008, or as James called it, the Akta OKU 2008. OKU means Orang Kurang Upaya which is persons with disability in um, our Malaysian language to be in, in Bahasa Malaysia, our national language to be actively enforced to show the commitment by the Malaysian authority in dealing 
with the legal issues pertaining to the disabled community. An improved law that fully protects and promotes the rights of PWDs would reduce the external barrier and challenges faced by ourselves. Therefore, it is suggested that this statute needs to be revised and amended accordingly to ensure maximum effectiveness of the enforcement. It seems that punitive remedy provisions should be introduced so that everyone treats persons with disabilities with respect and dignity. There is a need to uh, also extend the functions of the Council of Persons with Disabilities to investigate any complaints made by the PWDs by establishing a commission or tribunal to address those who are concerned. Future work uh, should consider the interview with relevant authorities to get insightful perspective on the issues discussed. Today, um, I'd like to uh, suggest a few suggestions that um, I've made um, to uh, our government and some work done by myself and my team. Um, the Genius Kurnia Early Intervention Centre needs to be established at least one in each state to ensure that the main purpose of this program is achieved, early intervention, and also um, uh, what you call it, um, concentrating on autism. Uh, this should be included as part of the 12th Malaysia Plan. I'd like to suggest that the early intervention services are no longer provided in clinics or hospitals, instead provided in care centres, nurseries and preschool classes. The government should also make it compulsory for children with uh, late development and high-risk children to follow early intervention programmes as is done in the US, and this should also be enforced through ACTS. Early intervention also offers savings for a community, as we all know by now. There must also be mandatory reporting for the registration of the disabled as done for cases of dengue, HIV or COVID-19. This matter is very, very important to ensure that no disabled person is left out and marginalised in the current modernity of the country. Thirdly, expand the existing category of the disabled and include rare diseases as one of the new categories. This is because some diseases are rarely recognised uh, by the Department of Social Welfare and the government is beneficial but not sufficient since the, the, the sense of disease really, since the rare disease um, occurs in small segment of the population, the government should have uh, the ability to allocate special funds to ensure that this group of patients um, has access to optimal treatment. We need a genetic counsellor. They need to play a big role in genetic counselling to patients and families, especially when they, are uh, when they are diagnosed with a rare disease. As you all know, there are 7,000 rare diseases in the world and um, most doctors don't know what they are right now. And most uh, people who have rare disease, my friends who have rare disease, are just put in a general category, you know, physical, because it's so new to us. This, um, this session uh, will explain what the disease is, um, you know, if, if that's been done and how the disease is inherited. Uh, treatment options, uh, disease prognosis and options for future pregnancies and encourage early early screening. Now, fourth, suggested, uh, I suggested that uh, sign language be made as a third language. I have a sister who's deaf. Uh, when we were younger, we actually signed because we didn't want our parents to know what we were talking about. But in the end, uh, it, was, it, it benefited. And right now, where I am, um, um, uh, I am... I am um, a chair at Bonama, which is a, a, a news uh, agency, and uh, we champion sign language, and um, we we are uh, having sign language uh, training um, centers so as we can cover both um, the Malay, the English, and also the Tamil for the Indians, and also the Chinese language. Now, learning sign language starting from school level is seen as an important way to form an inclusive community between the disabled and also the non-disabled when uh, the, the able to body. When sign language is made a third language starting from preschool, primary school, everyone will know how to communicate with those who are deaf. So no one gets left behind. So, you know, and when everybody grows up, they'll be able to, to find jobs to become sign language interpreters you know, whether you, you have a, a, any other uh, disability, you can still sign and, and work, you know. And fifth, also introduce sign language interpreting, uh, interpretation for parliament's session and government uh, and, and also our news agency, Bernama. Um, ever since I've joined uh, uh, the Senate last year, uh, Honorable um, Mike Lake and James and everyone, uh, we've actually um, um, pushed for sign language interpreters 
So now, um, you know, we have them signing at the upper house and also the lower house, which is great before, because be before this, my friends who uh, are deaf, they're not able to, um, you know, um, follow, um, you know, the sittings. Six, I urge the government to raise the minimum wage requirement for the allowance for the disabled in line with the increase um, of the poverty line income limit. Uh, which is right now 2,208 compared to 980 ringgit adopted since, uh, since 2005. Seven is to improve the accessibility and mobility for public transports. Eight is to allocate for the maintenance and maintenance and improvement of government schools, universities to be more friendly to the disabled. Nine, the welfare of Paralympic athletes and special incentives, and also the estab establishment of a special sports school for PWDs. I am a Paralympic athlete, I'm a sharpshooter, so I'm, you know, very passionate about this. Ten is to request the government to continue the grant of the OKU or the PWD Business Incentive Assistance Scheme in the 12th Malaysia Plan. Eleventh is uh, the Intellectual Property Corporation of Malaysia or my IPO has been urged to accelerate and intensify its efforts towards Malaysia's accession to the Marrakesh Treaty, which is aimed at empowering and facilitating uh, access to pub uh, published works for persons who are blind or partially sighted. Twelve, government and corporate sector have been urged to provide employment opportunities for PWDs, especially those from the B40s. Thirteen, the Ministry of Women, Family and Community Development have been asked, have been suggested by myself to create a special hotline for the disabled community to help them cope with the challenging situation of the COVID-19. I have so many to talk about to, to, to share with all of you, but all I can say right now is um, um, one of the things that I'm doing is also to um, provide um, public service announcements um, in the train, in television, on radio, and the social media to, to, to for everyone um, to um, to you know respect the facilities for the disabled and to understand us uh, a lot more, and to provide emergency short videos for the PWD students in sign language interpreter services, so that um, um, our deaf friends can also act in times of emergency as well as provide an intercom emergency system for the blind and a two-way camera screen or electronic message for our deaf friends. So these are some of the stuff that I've been doing, so many things. Uh, um, it's going to bore you, I know. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, I just want to say, you know, all of us who are disabled, we're always excited to try and dabble on new things. We'd like to be part of the society, be out there, excel and recognize. So, you know, let's not discriminate us, uh, but give our rights as a fellow human being. Um, I truly believe that um, if there's more awareness and understanding about us, then you know the the world will be much uh, will be a much brighter and and happier place. But having said that, I think um, one of the first things we need to do is actually to realize and understand that um, each of us. I always tell my friends that our disability is actually our ability. So. Um, from there, I, I you know, I, I just like to say, um, yeah, we, uh, uh, you know, so many things to do, so little time. Yes, I, I'm, I'm sure the Honourable Mike uh, would understand that. Uh, my Umar, he's 13 now. He's um, high functioning, but, you know, he's still what he is um, um, on the ASD, on the spectrum. Each and every one of our child's different. Um, it is, um, I take it upon myself to make sure that um, that I work very, very hard so that um, uh, the next generation of the disabled do not have to suffer or do not have to go through tough times like how myself and um, you know, the ones before me. So thank you everyone for giving me this opportunity to, to share with you. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Radzi. I'm sure there's a lot of um, politicians and parliamentarians out there who would like to describe themselves as as sharp, uh, sharp shooters in a sort of <laughs> metaphorical sense, but you quite literally are um, a, a sharp shooter in the very real sense. Uh, mm -hmm. And we absolutely appreciate your time at this late hour. We know that it's it's late in uh, in Malaysia at, 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 at this hour, so we really do appreciate it. Uh, very, very interesting to hear about Malaysia being one of the first uh, countries to ratify the Convention uh, on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, um, but also very interesting to hear that um, uh, certainly in your case, at least, not sort of resting on, on your laurels or, or or anything like that. And also this sort of the gap in the legislation between sort of it being an administrative act uh, and actually having sort of the remedial punitive 
um, sort of redress side of things was 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 very very interesting. Um, and sadly, it's 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 almost not surprising that there's a constitution that's silent on disability. I think there it's certainly the the constitution of Malaysia wouldn't be alone in in sense of of highlighting areas of discrimination but leaving out disability. Uh, we've certainly seen that's the case in in many other. Uh, guiding documents. So um, the more we can do to to change that, um, absolutely the better. And I think that that the, the point you finished on about um, leaving a world that's better for those that come after us is is absolutely true. Um, and and would absolutely echo that. So thank you, thank you so so much for a really really insightful presentation. It sounds like you're doing amazing uh, work for for PWDs in in Malaysia that could serve as a guide uh, for many other countries. So thank you so so much. Um, and final. Thank you so, so much. Uh, and last but by no means uh, least, Mr. Nenga uh, Shiwa, uh, who is a project lead on the Civ Acts uh, project at the Accountability Lab, who I know are doing amazing things um, in Nigeria uh, at the sort of grassroots level and civil society level, looking at um, the exclusion of persons with disabilities in, in um, participatory decision making and, and democracy, which really goes to the heart of what we do here at the CPA. So um, Really looking forward to what I'm sure is going to be a very, very interesting uh, presentation, Nenga. Uh, and the floor is all yours. Yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Jaspine. Um, I think it was, it's, it's just my pleasure to be in the midst of uh, great leaders of the world to discuss this important issue. Um, I'm going to speak uh, specifically on five thematic areas. The last two will be my major focus. Um, the first three will just be to gross over the work we do, and then the last two we center on the crux of uh, the whole uh, work we do at the Accountability Lab, especially as regards the PWDs. Uh, first and foremost, Accountability Lab Nigeria is uh, part of the network of the Accountability Lab Global that works in ensuring that government work for all the citizens around the world. Uh, in Nigeria, we have a focus which is to see that we support uh, active citizens and responsible leaders. In doing this, we have a number of projects we and pursue. One of them is called Integrity Icon Nigeria, where we name and firm honest uh, public servants. We also have SDG 16, which focuses on building peace blocks, uh, encouraging strong institu institutions, and ensuring that we have uh, a convenient environment where uh, everybody will sit and be comfortable. Um, we also have accountability to better which is a cohort of young Nigerians who are committed to bring it, bringing about transformation in their little spaces. There are those who focus on uh, dispersation of immunization drugs, those who focus on uh, uh, looking at fake drugs, and those who do a number of things within their little spaces. And so we also have Voice to Rep, which is a project that uh, trains and then encourages young Nigerians to sing music, social conscious music around uh, issues of the society such as marginalization of uh, persons with disabilities, women rights, uh, youth, and a couple of other things. And the one on which we have the PW or I mean PWD is featured on prominently is the civic action teams. In civic action teams, we work with communities, we collect data, and then we use that data as a feedback to interface between the affected communities and persons, and then the uh, government officials or the state actors. So uh, it is under this umbrella that we are currently uh, doing a project known as voice inclusion. Voice inclusion is not specifically focused on the PWDs, but it, it has a trial of the PWDs, the women, and then the youth. Uh, in the course of implementing these projects in the last uh, eight, year, eight, eight months, 
we have come to understand that the PWDs have peculiar issues that needs to urgently look at. But before I go into our findings and learnings, uh, we employed a couple of tools. Well, these last few months we've been doing, we did a survey, we'll be having uh, radio talk shows where we bring in persons with disabilities also to speak to their plights. And then we'll have had so many town hall meetings uh, where we, we interface between the PWDs and relevant government agencies consent or place with the charge of ensuring that their plights are reasonably taken care of. Uh, specifically, we are working in Imo State, that is three states of Nigeria, Imo State, Kaduna, and Federal Capital Territory, Abuja. Um, we also have a series of jingles that we played, uh, some of them in local languages, in Hausa, in Igbo, in Bagi, where we try to communicate directly to the people and then to the communities where most of these people are found in. Um, we have also done a series of advocacies to the local governments in the states I mentioned, that is Imo, Kaduna, IOCT, Abuja. And we have also met with some commissioners on other relevant state actors in the respective states that uh, we've been working in. So as, a, as an outcome of what we've been doing, um, we have come, we have learned, or we have found out a couple of things. One of them is the fact that the PWDs in Nigeria really do not have a voice. Uh, let me quickly point out the fact that we have a, a, a discrimination against persons with disabilities act passed into law. Uh, it was a B, but it was eventually passed into law in 2018. And uh, ever since then, it was only last month that, okay, uh, not last month, but January this year, that a commission which was provided for in that act was constituted. Now, a couple of months, even after constituting the commission, much has not really uh, sprung up for us to begin to see that, okay, the government is seriously concerned about the plights of these people. And uh, very quickly too, we share some similarities with uh, Malaysia. So when Senator Lazi was talking, I was just having a smile down here that uh, most of the things they suffer there are things we have here. Even though we have an act that provided for the protection of persons with disabilities, we have noticed uh, a major limitation, which is that of funding. Uh, I think it's not, it's, there's no gain saying, talking about the status of Nigeria as a third world country or as a developing nation. And one of the major problems we tend to speak about every now and then is that of inadequate funding. So the act did not uh, specifically provide for where the funding for the good of the people with disabilities in Nigeria could be cut out for. Besides that, there are challenges with the implementation of the act itself. Nigeria operates a federal structure and the states have a reasonable level of autonomy to do what they want to do within their jurisdiction. And so there is this challenge of whether the states should go ahead and domesticate the act as passed at the national level or for them to go ahead and come up with their respective bills and then allow them to go through the normal processes and pass into state acts. So this has been a challenge. We've written letters to the 36 state governors of the Federation. Uh, so far, we have gotten responses from five. We have had meetings with appropriate commissioners in, in, follow, in, five, sorry, in, three, in three states. And the feedback we got uh, seems to have tilted towards the same direction, which is that um, the states are having a feeling that the federal government just want to uh, usurp their powers or to uh, bring in a kind of hegemony because they can't just pass the laws at the national level 
and then expect them to easily domesticate. So there is this feeling of disagreement that has to be seriously looked, looked into. Besides that, we, because of these issues, we also discovered there is underrepresentation of the people with disabilities. Um, there are many indices that we can look at this from. Let's begin with political participation. As we speak, I'm not sure we have any uh, member of the legislature, either the national or the state assemblies who is uh, currently serving as a parliamentarian. So if you are coming from the parliamentary index, then you can say we have zero on that. We are looking at, at appointed positions. Um, I'm not also aware of any, but previously I know we have one senator uh, who uh, is no longer in the Senate at the moment, but we once had one. And I also remember one of the state governors from Ben West, they once appointed a visually paid person to be his political advisor. So looking at even from the appointee angle, we have a very insignificant participation. Then if you look at the voting system and the structure of our ballot papers and the uh, cubicle where people go into to uh, print and then drop their uh, drop into the boxes. We also have a big challenge there because it is not uh, PWD friendly, especially for the blind, uh, for the crippled, and those who have some physical uh, deformities. So this is also uh, a very huge challenge. Um, the lack of government interest in persons with disabilities is another thing. So just, just like I mentioned the passage of the act, which, is, which has not really translated into uh, any meaningful uh, transformation in the lives of these people. Uh, there is very little awareness on the act itself. So not many Nigerians even know that this act is there. This act actually provided for some safety nets for the good of the PWDs, unfortunately, many of them are not even aware of this. And because of their uh, low economic status coming, maybe essentially as a result of their low uh, level of education, which gives them very little exposure and access to economic opportunities, uh, many of them really uh, do not have capacity to take good care of themselves in terms of maybe themselves furthering their education, sending their younger ones or their children to school, uh, having good access to medical health care and things like that. So this has been a huge challenge. Even though the act provided uh, for the provision of all this, uh, and the five years transition, especially in terms of access, access to public institutions uh, or public structures, such as prov provisioning of uh, ramps and um, elevators for the good of the, this has not actually uh, happened uh, with uh, great levels of uh, advocacy coming from accountability lab and some other organizations uh, or civil societies working on the plus of the PWDs. Uh, a, a little, we are being see, we are seeing a very little change or kind of um, a gradual effort to modify some of the buildings so that they will be compliant with the provisions of the act. However, um, we've, we, we've looked at the situation around and we are looking at going forward that are uh, at least eight issues that could be of concern. One is the fact that there is need for value reorientation. What this implies here is that most of the people, uh, most of Nigerians tend to look at people or persons with disabilities as absolute liabilities. So coming from this context, uh, very little attention is given to them in terms of uh, persons with rights, but rather we tend to look at it from a welfare perspective. And so we feel there is a need to move away from the welfare uh, approach to persons with disabilities, but in actual sense to consider their challenges as actually as actually uh, human rights concerns. Um, there is also a need to push for 
pro PWDs, uh, governments and policies. Uh, we have come to understand that even in instances where there are certain government policies that provide for the good of these people, uh, very little is done in terms of ensuring that these benefits are driven to the benefits of persons with disabilities. Uh, to do this, there is need for policy monitoring so that we don't just look at, look at policies in terms of how they have been drafted, but we look at it in terms of how, uh, how the implementations look like, how many persons have benefited from it, if there are any issues that need a change. And that will take us to policy dialogue so that there will be an interface between the persons with disabilities represented by their unions or umbrella bodies, as well as civil societies working in that space uh, in conjunction with the government so that we can begin to look at areas where there are deficiencies and what needs to be done. And then we, we, there will be need for campaigns for policy change because some of them are not really uh, encapsulating the interest of the PWDs in the context of contemporary society. Uh, there is also need for media pro projection of the potentials of the PWDs because we have come to understand that these persons are looked upon as persons without any abilities at all, which is actually a fiction because we have seen some of them who have gone to school, they are way educated and the discrimination is there. So sometimes when they put up their beautiful CVs and their competencies, and then they appear at the scenes of interview, they are discriminated upon, especially when they are viewed with physical deformities. So even though the act provides for their protection, that at least 5% of uh, public organizations' employment should be reserved uh, for the group, I mean, for uh, PWDs, this is currently not, not happening. And then in the private sector, that factor of discrimination, by merely seeing them, nobody cares to know what they have to offer, but they see them as, oh, because this person, maybe his hand is amputated, he has an amputation on his leg, he is crippled, so he or she cannot be able to deliver or anything. So this is one area we need, so the media, the need for media projection of the potential, especially when we have some good ones who are uh, made, making good exploits and making impacts within the environment. Again, there is need for drive uh, towards mind shift on the part of the PWDs themselves. Earlier on, I mentioned their low economic status and in most of the Northern parts of Nigeria, what you see is most of them are taken to streets where they beg for arms. So that this gives them a sense of defeat. It takes away their boldness and confidence to pursue some other meaningful engagements that could make them uh, meaningful members of the society. So there is need to make to, to take away that kind of orientation and make them believe in themselves and condition their minds that they can be able to do any other thing that no more human beings uh, do. I think no more human being may not be the best language here, but maybe for lack of proper adjective, or maybe it's essentially what I mean is those, they can be able to do those things that some of us who have uh, a sense of completeness, in terms of a uh, sense of uh, physical attributes, do they can they, most of them can do even better than us uh, thank then, you so much menenga i'm just conscious of of time um and 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 the need to uh, have the question and answer and um, if i could just ask you to to wrap up the 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 presentation apologies but um just so that we can get some other um voices involved okay that is fine so um basically these are these are the way forward we're looking at but good enough we have some prospects which I will mention them very shortly. Uh, one of them is the ratification of the UN uh, Convention on Persons with disabilities, with disabilities in Nigeria, which was done in 2017. The passage of the Discrimination Against the Persons with Disabilities Act in 2018. And the fact that Nigeria signed on to OGP, which means that uh, no one should actually be left behind. So we are hoping that leaning on these uh, provisions, uh, we can be able to push and with other hands on decks, uh, we can make our society better for every citizen. 
the PWD is inclusive. So thank you so much, uh, Jens, for the opportunity and a hangover at this moment. Yeah. Thanks so much, Menga. That was, that was uh, fascinating. Um, yeah, and again, I guess we're seeing a little bit of this uh, implementation gap in terms of legislation. We have the legislation there, but um, sort of the real world change, we're still waiting to see it. And fantastic to see that the Accountability Lab is also looking at, at youth um, as looking to youth to bring about uh, the change. I think that's been a bit of a running theme um, in this webinar, which is great for, for Clive and myself, as people who also uh, run our youth work here. So great that there's been that, um, that cross-section and also very interesting the points you're making about um, shifting perspectives and the role of uh, the, the potential role of the media um, in that. Um, and, and yeah, hopefully we start to see even more progress in, in Nigeria towards the um, sort of equal treatment and eradication of uh, discrimination against persons with disabilities. Um, so thank you so, so much. I think we've had three very, very different, uh, but all three very enlightening uh, and informative uh, presentations. Uh, I would like to open it um, to the Q&A. Um, I recognize quite a few names um, in the attendees list and not naming anyone specific, but I know at least a few people who are sure to have um, questions. I know they have um, a lot of experience and expertise in this area. Um, so I look forward to, to a few of those coming in. We did have receive a few questions uh, in advance um, of the session. So maybe I can start there as people uh, hopefully start to send some of their questions um, in. Uh, and, and the question I'll start with, and I'll, I'll put it to uh, all three um, of the panelists. Um, one question came through to us, which was, uh, what barriers have you had to overcome in your own jurisdiction in, in, in advocating for the rights of persons with disabilities? Um, and I guess in terms of barriers, I'll also include sort of um, maybe having to change change mindsets and, 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 and that sort of thing. Um, so if I, I might start with, with Honourable Lake, uh, if I might. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say that, uh, you know, from a starting point when Jaden was uh, about two years old, right around the time we were figuring there was something going on with him, um, this would have been around 1997. Uh, he was diagnosed in 1998, but there were a group of families uh, in the province I'm from, which is Alberta, who were advocating very, very strongly for an evidence-based early intervention program. So I heard the Senator also mention early intervention and the importance of it. Um, in, in autism, as many things, but in autism particularly, that window between sort of two and five is such a critical window to, uh, to provide help and to uh, you know, work on, on some of the challenges. And so um, we owe, because, because in Jaden's case, he was just behind that wave. And so we owe a lot of the impact that those programs had on him pre his school years to the parents just before that banded together and advocated very, very strongly with the government here. And I'll just say one last thing is that um, as he went through schooling, there was pretty good support. And then we're still dealing at this point in time with supports for adults across the country here in Canada around things like vocation and post-secondary education and, and housing and those kind of things. So they, they talk about the sort of falling off the cliff when people hit the end of their uh, of their high school years, it is a challenge that even here in Canada we still have to uh, work on and, and strengthen our uh, availability of sports. Uh, thanks, thanks so much, Honourable Lake, uh, Senator Senator Radzi, Do you have any response as well? Oh, I think you might be on mute, Senator. Actually, yeah. I just want to share a bit about what I went through because I wasn't born, um, uh, you know. I, I wasn't born uh, disabled, I was in a car crash. So um, one of the things that um, I went through was discrimination as in getting back to what I was doing. Um, I was a, a news anchor uh, um, for a long time since I was 18. And then when I became disabled, uh, the station that I was working with did not wanna have me work with them anymore, I think. I give them the benefit of the doubt because, you know, that's what you should be doing, really. Um, um, I, I I told myself it's probably because um, they um, didn't understand um, what it is like to be having someone who's disabled to work in their organization. So you know, but 
after uh, so so I, I have to share here which I share with friends um, as well so for six years I didn't have a job right and and every time I wanted to go and 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 seek for a job they always come up with all kinds of of, of excuses yeah so that's discrimination there already and uh, the struggles that I went through was that you know for that six years um, I was actually um, eating rice with salt and drinking tap water for six years. Um, I didn't tell my parents that I didn't have a job. Um, I kept going back to see them and hanging out with them and eating their food. They thought their food was nice. Yeah, it was, but in actual fact, I just didn't have money to eat, you know. And um, but I kept at it. I kept at it for for years and years and years. And the thing that pulled me through, quite honestly, everyone, is actually my sense of humor, having faith. Um, but in actual fact is I borrowed the spirit of my disabled friends. So um, from someone who's able and suddenly becoming disabled, you know, it was very difficult for me. I'm the kind of girl who was riding Harleys and stuff like that, and I couldn't do that anymore. You know, everybody thought that, you know, if you if you are disabled, that means you've lost your marbles. In actual fact, not all of us have lost it. And even if you're not disabled, some people will lose it. You know, so what I'm saying is right now, first, we need to create more awareness. Very important, you know, and we need to actually be there, support each other. Like what we're doing right now, we're discussing, we're sharing different parts of the world, what we are going through, you know, and... Um, um, and, and we must make sure that, um, you know, we, we, we change people's mindset. I have to be very honest with you sometimes. Uh, some parts of the rural areas, there's still people who actually, um, um, you know, have their ch children shackled underneath the houses or in, in, in the barn, you know, with the cows and the goats because they don't know how to, to um, uh, uh, help the child who's, who have mental disability or uh, who are uh, severe uh, autism. So things like this, we have to educate, um, you know, the, the public, very, very important. Education, very important. That's of the utmost. Creating awareness, creating awareness, yeah. Uh, many thanks, uh, a very, very powerful and, and moving answer. Um, and I'll, I'll come to Nenga uh, uh, again, uh, last but by no means least. Um, Nenga, if you have a response to the question posed. Yes, thank you so much. Um, the major the major challenges we have to battle with here, one is the outright perception of the greater majority of Nigerians that Nigeria as a country has so many issues to grapple with rather than to concentrate on the PWDs who the courts are mostly seen as persons with uh, they're just seen as people without the potential to contribute. So people just feel like, okay, instead of giving this direction and attention, why not focus on other deplorable issues, <clears throat> excuse me, such as provisioning of basic necessities like water, like electricity, like roads. So they see expenditure that should go into this as a waste. Another bigger challenge is that of getting the government involved because coming in as an NGO, when you try to create that interface so that you give the PWDs an opportunity to speak to the authorities and they may then respond, uh, it becomes very difficult. Most of the authorities are not willing to give into this. Then we have the challenge of the defeatist posture of the PWDs themselves, especially in the Northern instruction. This is coupled with the religious teaching uh, that we have up here indicating that, okay, these people, they should resign to their fair, they should be taken to the street. So they tend to forget every other opportunity, any other potential that lies ahead of them that they could possibly ride on to become better citizens. And then finally, and importantly, is that of publicity. Uh, very little awareness is created to, for people to see these uh, brothers and sisters as human beings, the right human beings like us, and then, for also uh, appropriate institutions, be it private and public, to begin to synergize so that some of the basic challenges they face on daily, they face on daily basis, can be taken out. So basically, this is what we face from this part of the world in this space. 
Uh, thank you so much, Nenga. Uh, I see there is a question in the question and answer uh, function um, from an anonymous uh, attendee. Um, currently, Guernsey has no legislation on disability, but did pass a policy letter for this to happen last year. Uh, what single most important statement would you say to encourage the business community and I guess the wider society uh, to support this legislation apart from it being the right thing to do? Uh, we are getting quite a bit of pushback. So I, I suppose the person posing the question is asking, um, what's the sort of the golden bullet uh, to get support for, for disability sensitive uh, legislation? What's, what's the sort of the golden sentence, I suppose? Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll take the same uh, order as, as last time. So uh, Honorable Lake. You know, I'm gonna, I know our, our time is gonna run out soon and I, I'm looking at it. There's also another question, um, it looks like from Guernsey as well. Uh, in the chat. So, uh, and they're, you know, both I can kind of bring them together in a sense that when I think about um, uh, the, the autism world, and it would relate in other areas, but my, I, I know a lot about, about autism. Um, when we try and find common ground on where we need action, it, there's almost like an order through the lifespan. So first of all, it's important to think about the lifespan. Um, the question in the chat is about diagnosis and subsequent pathways. So um, we've kind of narrowed it down to, to six main things we always talk about, uh, and it's all virtually translatable wherever you are in the world. Um, the first is diagnosis um, and early diagnosis. The second then is once you have a diagnosis, what does early intervention look like that's going to sort of start on the right road there uh, for someone? Education, so they're going to transition into the education system, someone on the spectrum. And then after education, I talked about that cliff before, but you know, what is, uh, what is meaningful employment look like, you know, in terms of what is, what are, how do we unlock the amazing potential that people with autism have or people with any developmental disability or, or in the broad disability community, how can we unlock the potential so that they can contribute? So employment, which leads to housing, they're kind of combined in sort of that post-secondary after, after uh, uh, school phase. And then the, the big question for parents of kids with autism would be what happens when we're gone. We want to make sure that we've got a system in place that's going to be there for them and support them uh, in a world where all they've known is their sort of family support. And so this is sort of the pathway that we kind of take a look at. And governments across the world, no matter where you are, it's a uh, these are similar challenges in the developing world and the developed world that we need to tackle and 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 uh, and address significantly. So I would say on the particular legislator on the particular question about the business community, um, I found that in Canada, when you connect with business people, I think there is a, a willingness to hire people with disabilities. I think that we work, have to work harder to sort of build in those job coaching supports and sort of uh, that the awareness that the senator talked about. If you have a broad awareness of uh, you know the potential and the challenges that uh, need to be mitigated, I do think that at least in 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 Canada. I think there's a, a really strong willingness in the business community's part to get involved, but uh, but we have to we have to do a better job as governments in creating a structure that makes it easier for them. Excellent, thanks so much, Uncle uh, Lake. Uh, Senator Senator Radzi. Hi. Sorry, you were saying just now about um, the awareness. Yeah. Um, is, is that what our question is? Uh, yeah, in, in, in many ways, yes. I think the question was about um, getting support for disability sensitive legislation from the business community and sort of what, what is a good way of, of getting support for disability sensitive legislation. Well, okay, I just want to share with you guys um, in Malaysia, um, there is a, a, a somewhat a ruling where each of the government agency has to employ um, at least one percent of a person uh, of persons with disability in 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 in, in uh, their different ministries. So right now we have uh, three ministries, uh, sorry, four ministries, which has uh, uh, you know taken in more than one percent, and the highest, which has covered uh, two percent, is actually the women's uh, uh, ministry, uh, where the uh, welfare department is in. So um, now I'm going to all the ministers one by one, different ministries, um, you know, as what um, uh, the Honourable uh, Lake was saying that, you know, we, 
actually we have to work hand in hand um i am so glad to hear that you know in the way you're at you know companies are more open you know um, um to 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 uh, take in persons with disability but right here in malaysia um, um what i'm doing is um especially uh, in, in the Senate is actually meeting all the ministers and saying, hey, you know what, you know, like, let, let's do this. Let's do more programs for them. Let's let's get them together. And it is working slowly, but surely. Um, it's just that with the um, private sectors, um, job coaching is very, very important, especially when you are employing someone uh, with uh, who's on the uh, on the spectrum. Um, job coaching is very important. And then you also have to to simulate the, the you know, office environment for them. Um, so that they know what to do, the, the system and stuff like that. And uh, we, we must never uh, let them go. We must always monitor them. So um, um, with the Human Resource Ministry, um, they have a special job coach um, 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 a unit where they um, actually support um, persons with disability who's working. And I have to share with you guys right here, right now, um, um, uh, our government has come up with this um, we give incentives to the government. So um, in order for the persons with disability to get the allowances of 450 ringgit each month, their salary cannot go about 1,200. So right now, the government says during the pandemic, if a company employs a person with disability and um, yeah, with, with a salary of 1,200, the government will subsidize and pay 1,000 ringgit. That means you only pay 200 ringgit. So yeah, that's something we're doing right here, right now. Thank you very much, Senator Radzi. Um, Neng, I'm conscious of, of the time, um, but I, I would like to give you the opportunity uh, to also provide a response. And I might actually just go to Mr. Kitchen, uh, who has been very patiently um, holding his hand up. Um, Nenga, please. Yeah, thank you so much. I think, uh, first and foremost, my take would be from the angle of social corporate responsibility. Businesses have a social corporate responsibility. So if they can do this by setting, providing scholarship for students of host communities, providing electricity, or some, some of the things, depending on where uh, they are found, I think it will not be out of place for them to push for the legislation. And I think to do this, uh, the essential thing to do is to lobby it through, uh, there are two options actually. One is that they can get a significant member support from the legislature or the parliament of Guse, or the other option is to make, make sure it goes to uh, maybe the president or whosoever the prime minister the case may be as an executive being. So if the uh, business community is willing to take this angle to support or lobby as the case may be or advocate in some quarters so that that legislation can be fast tracked, I think this could be one sure way to make sure they support the process of getting that legislation passed. Thank you so much, uh, Nenga. Um, as I say, uh, I don't know if Clive uh, is happy to allow Mr. Kitchen uh, to speak. We're breaking our own rule in uh, in saying not just uh, written answers we're allowing, um, or rather written questions we're allowing oral questions as well. Uh, Mr. Kitchen, please. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. We can. Thank you very much. And I want to thank all three of the present presenters for their, their presentation. I was greatly appreciated. I, I quickly just want to ask Senator Radzi a, a question. Um, I, I am um, deaf in, in my left ear and, and have I'm hearing impaired. And one of the challenges we have in Canada is, is in the issue of sign language and um, in the House of Commons. And, and I was interested to hear your comments about sign language starting at school and, and using it almost as a third language. And I'm just if you could maybe expand, I'd love to hear a little bit more on that and, and avenues that we might be able to pursue that up here in Canada. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Mr. Kitchen. Well, okay. Um, when I suggested that, um, I actually have been uh, sitting down and um, working closely with the Malaysian Federation of the Deaf. Um, um, right now in Malaysia, the registered uh, population of the, uh, the deaf is actually uh, 50,000, but um, 15% of a country's population under the, the WHO, um, that means in Malaysia it's 4.7 million. Uh, we have more deaf people out here actually, but um, only 50,000 uh, have um, been registered. Um, what the uh, Malaysian Federation of the Deaf is doing right now is um, 
we are trying to go down to the ground and um, uh, work um, with uh, centers, um, especially um, uh, kindies, um, you know, for able body as well, um, so that we can get the children to pick up sign language. And then the other thing we're doing is we are actually coming up with um, programs um, um, on how to sign. Uh, this will be uh, on air. Um, so that people have the opportunities um, to, to, to learn. And then from then on, we capture it and have it on social media. So these are the little, little things that we're doing. When I came up with the idea of having uh, sign language as a third language, everybody thought that I was myself deaf. They thought that I, I, I have lost it because it's, it's almost impossible because some people can't even speak certain, certain languages. But I said, you know what? I said, um, I have friends who's deaf and who's become blind or who's blind who's become deaf. So I think right now what we need to do, everyone should learn this because, you know, we, 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 um, uh, not everyone can, can, can read lit, but what we can do is for some of us who can still see is sign. And the best thing to do is with children because they, they have a thing with their fingers and they, they memorize it much better, um, you know, um, you know, when signing. So it's still in the early stages, but, um, um, like I said, slowly but surely, I think if we all can do this, the world will be a much better place and we can communicate better. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kitchen, for your for your question and Senator Radzi for your very uh, informed um, answer. I have seen there are a few more questions uh, in the chat and Q&A, but I'm conscious of, of the time. So unfortunately, I'm sure we could be here for another hour and, and still have um, very, very fruitful discussions. Um, I have written down all the, all the questions we haven't got to. Um, so if some of the panelists are happy to sort of uh, provide written answers at a later, at a later time, um, then I'd absolutely be happy to take that, take that forward for those who unfortunately weren't able to get to your questions. Um, and I'd also like to thank again, our, our three panelists uh, for three very, very different, but all three absolutely superb um, presentations. I've, I've got a lot of emails in my inbox now uh, from many people saying how much they've enjoyed this. Um, and to Miss Tina Berry, yeah, absolutely, I'll, I'll, I'll share that document um, that, I, that I already mentioned. Everyone will we'll take everyone's um, contact details and we'll, we'll absolutely share that round. Um, but yeah, again, thank you so much to our presenters um, and to everybody who attended, asked questions. And, and um, yeah, I'd, I'd just like to draw the, the session to a close with a, with a great big thank you on behalf of everybody at the uh, CPA Secretariat. So thank you so much.